There are two historical repositories in New York City that reveal in fascinating detail the application of the telephone principle to the service of mankind. In one on Lower Broadway are preserved the records that tell the entire story of the effort to introduce and carry on the service of intercommunication by the spoken word. Here are the reports and correspondence of the pioneers whose work and faith were the foundations of today's great industry. Here are the records that disclose the early vision of a unified system and of universal service, and that mark the progress toward that ideal. Here, among the memories of an industry's birth, are the early directories with about a few dozen names to illustrate the slow but growing acceptance of the telephone's aid to living. And here are two treasured relics of appealing significance to the men and women of the Bell System who come like pilgrims to this eloquent room. One is the grant issued on March the 7th, 1876, proclaiming Alexander Graham Bell to be the inventor of the medium of communication we call the telephone, though it was then officially designated as an improvement in telegraphy. The other is the notebook of Bell's assistant, Thomas Watson, with its casually pencil record of the first complete sentence that human ear ever heard over a wire. Bell's sudden call on March the 10th, 1876. Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. What an amazing circumstance it is that the first of all telephone calls should have been, I want you, as though to signify the reason for all the calls to follow. In the other repository on West Street, are exhibits of corresponding significance. It is a museum that reveals the development of the telephone art as expressed in apparatus. To begin this physical record of scientific accomplishment are the harmonic telegraph instruments of Bell's early experiments and the other instruments that followed before the telephone itself emerged from its first laboratory. You may see here a coil of the actual wire over which passed those historic words, I want you. There is the great company of telephones which progressively represent the improving standards of service. There are switchboards which set the friendly operators of another day. Preserved here and appropriately labeled are historic transmitters through which speech first rolled the radio waves across the seas, and others with which presidents have talked for the heads of many nations in dedicating new telephonic links to distant lands. Here are sections of cable to mark the development that brought about today's technical and manufacturing triumphs with their amazing capacity for circuits. From a few dozen wires to thousands is the progress that this dated sequence tells. Here, too, is another historical sequence of exhibits to illustrate a story of intense interest to every student of telephone accomplishment. The story of the search for amplifying devices that would help to send intelligible speech over longer and longer spans of wire. And here are portraits of men, scientists and engineers of yesterday and of today, whose names are written large on the honor roll of communications development. Visitors from all parts of the world have viewed these reminders of the treasure hunt for knowledge from which might come at the builder's hands the agency of service that now is in your charge. Mutely, they tell of the effort to meet a challenge, the challenge of social need. Such a story can only be outlined here with now and then a scene to suggest the problems faced. As a preface, let us mark an announcement of 1877, the first published offering of instruments for wire conversation, but only for distances up to 20 miles. And now, let us reconstruct from the record an incident of 1880, remembering that the date is only two years after the first commercial switchboard began the service of intercommunication. The scene is a building on Washington Street in Boston. This is the telephone office, isn't it? Sure. All the telephone talk goes right through this room. Well, then perhaps you can help me. You see, I have no telephone. It's mostly the business people who have. <laughs> That's why I'm here. 
and I want to talk with my son about his father. All right. I guess we can fix it for you. The telephone's right here. Where is he? He's in Chicago. Chicago? Oh, but he's he's a contractor now, and he's doing very well. I'm quite sure he has a telephone. I just must talk with him. You want to talk to him on a wire? Thank you, sir. Did you hear that, John? Here's a lady who wants to talk to Chicago. Oh, I'm sorry, madam. There are no wires to Chicago. We have a wire to Salem, that's 15 miles, and one to Lowell, that's 25 miles. But you can't hear over them very well. They're always noisy. We have the telegraph messages over them most of the time. The longest wire is to Worcester, that's 40 miles, but it's no good for talking. But I don't understand. I saw all the wires on the roof, and I thought they went many places. <laughs> and I did so want to talk with my son. I wish you could. You can. Uh, someday. I'm sure you can someday. But this is a new business. No one knows much about it yet. Oh, dear, I thought if I came here, and there are no wires. What will I do? Hadn't you better telegraph? That's mighty quick. Oh, yes, I know it's quick, but it's not the same thing. Oh, I did so want to hear my son's voice, and I wanted to tell him something myself, and I wanted to hear his answer myself. Well, thank you, young gentleman. We're sorry we can't help you. I hope it's not bad news. Oh, no. Well, someday there'll be a wire, a quiet wire, and then you can talk with each other. I hope so. I'm very sorry we can't help you now. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. What was the use of all that stuff about a wire to Chicago? You must have lost some of your buttons, John Carty. That's what I think. It's going to come someday, Harry. Something tells me it's coming. It has to come. Why does it have to come? We're busy enough now with the Boston folk wanting express companies and banks and wholesale houses. Who wants to talk to Chicago? That's a thousand miles. Who wants to talk to Chicago? Well, that lady does. She expected to. You know, Boston banks would talk to Chicago banks if they could. And Chicago people would talk to Boston people. There'll be a wire someday because it's needed and to other cities just this far away. Something tells me. <laughs> Something tells you. It's one of the little folk who's been whispering to you. It's coming, Harry. It's got to come. We're going to talk to Chicago and Father yet. It's all of Mr. Bell's discovery. That's complete. It's a principle. Someone will find out how to use it better. Something tells me. Something tells me. And now, starting with this glimpse, it's still within the memory of millions of Americans, let us dip into the record that tells of one of the great technological romances of all time. The telephone art had yet to be developed. Electrical engineering was not yet a course of study in American colleges. There were only about 200 communities where a primitive service had been introduced to a doubting public. In all America, there were fewer telephones than you will find today in seven or eight New York office buildings. A telephone circuit was part wire and part earth, with the speech it carried, of course, at the mercy of any electrical disturbance in earth or air. A thunderstorm would completely prevent conversation. Not for many months was it discovered that an all-metal circuit would result in clearer speech. It was truly a daring experiment that was completed in 1884, a two-wire circuit for speech between Boston and New York. But it led to an historic decision. Yes. Well, as soon as possible, Mr. Cahill. Oh, yes, yes, they're all here and waiting for you. Very well, thank you. Mr. Cahill will be here in a few minutes with the Certificate of Incorporation, ready for our signatures. This craft, if it seems all right to me... And to me. Well, it certainly takes in a lot of territory. How do you mean? Uh, this section here. It says that our lines will connect uh, one or more points in each and every city, town, or place in the state of New York 
with one or more points in each and every other city, town or place in said state, and in each and every other of the United States. Yes, it's pretty inclusive, but then Vale's been talking about a vast system for years. With his ideas, he's certainly the man to be the new company's first president. This language makes me smile when I think of the trouble my company has had right here in New York City trying to get subscribers. It is rather optimistic language. Of course, some of these electrical experts are mighty skeptical. I've been looking for a certain editorial in the electrical world. Oh, here it is. It is probable that in the near future, business communications by telephone between cities separated by hundreds of miles will be an everyday occurrence. But it will be a luxury for the few, bearing the same relation to telegraphy in general that traveling in Pullman cars does to ordinary railroad travel. That may be the way it looks now. But the line to Boston is being used by all sorts of people, even though it isn't very good. We'll find ways of making the service popular. Well, let's hope the next line down to Philadelphia will work better. A lot of my New York subscribers say they need it. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, Jay. Sorry I kept you waiting. That's perfectly all right, my boy. Well, I've got the final draft. Have any changes been made, Mr. Cahill? Only one. Now, if you gentlemen will turn to page three, where it says, in each and every other city, town, or place in said state, and in each and every other of the United States, and in Canada and Mexico, got it? This is to be added. And each and every of said cities, towns, and places is to be connected with each and every other city, town, or place in said states and countries and also by cable and other appropriate means with the rest of the known world. The rest of the known world? Sacred codfish. Well, why not? Ten years ago, you couldn't talk by wire at all. It's a legal precaution, gentlemen. Mr. Forbes and Mr. Vale feel the new company should not be limited in its future activities. Whatever can be done, they want the company prepared to do. The rest of the known world, eh? Well, gentlemen, we're certainly starting from scratch. Will you sign first, Mr. Hall? Gladly. Sign your name on the top line, please. So it was that in February 1885, there came into existence the organization you call the AT&T Company, founded in the infancy of the telephone to pioneer long-distance service, but destined 15 years later to become the central company of your system. While transmitters, receivers, and switching devices were being improved, an important development came from the study and introduction of the principle of transposition. The application of this interesting principle involved shifting the current path by interchanging the position of the two wires of the circuit. This exchange of the pin position of the two wires at carefully determined intervals helps to reduce the interference brought to the circuit by induction from parallel electrical currents. The part that accuracy of transposition is playing in the modern art of transmission is evident to any expert eye that scans the complex wire facilities of today. Thus, with all wire circuits, the transposition principle, an organized laboratory investigation for every department of telephone activity, there was encouragement to the effort to link together the growing telephone organizations. Yet, when wires were made to talk a thousand miles in 1892, the accomplishment only emphasized the character of obstacles still to be overcome. Too loud. But how about the Far West? 
We have important agents on the Pacific Coast. When can we telephone to them? <laughs> I'm afraid that's something nobody knows. But surely you're going to put up more wires. Of course. But a thousand miles is about the limit for talking. But, sir, I don't understand. A wire is a wire. We can telegraph to the Pacific Coast. Yes, <laughs> a wire is a wire. But a telephone circuit and a telegraph circuit are entirely different things. Let me explain it to you very simply. Here's your telephone transmitter. Here's a receiver. Here is the battery that furnishes the electrical current. Here is a wire circuit. This is you about to talk. <laughs> Very good. That does look like me. When you talk, your transmitter diaphragm vibrates correspondingly. This produces electric waves on the wire which conform to the vibrations your voice has caused. The electric current makes the receiver diaphragm vibrate. These vibrations are similar to those of the transmitter diaphragm. They are reconverted into sound. And that's what the man at the receiver hears. I understand all that. It seems very simple. But if the electric waves reach Chicago, why not San Francisco? They will. But the speech would not be intelligible. You see, the electric waves which represent your voice grow weak with distance. Then they get smothered by the other waves on the wire. What are the waves? Oh, electrical disturbances and other things. We call it noise. When your speech level gets down to the noise level, the man at the other end of the wire won't hear it. So that's it. That's the situation. What we need is a device that will take the electric current when it becomes weak, restore it to its original strength, and keep unchanged the wave pattern that represents your speech. Sounds like a fine idea. Oh, we have the idea, but we haven't found the device. When we do, we'll have better lines. The only alternative is to increase the size of the wires and space them farther apart. Well, why not do that? Here's the kind of wire used on the new circuit to Chicago. What we call the number eight size. This means 870 pounds of copper to the mile. The two wires must be spaced about 12 inches apart. At certain intervals, they are transposed. Transposed? Yes. That helps to overcome induction. Induction? That's what causes the noise I was telling you about. Now, we could string wires all the way across the country, but they'd have to be larger than these number eights and with wider spacing. Probably, oh, 24-inch spacing would do the job. Well, if you can do it, I think you should do it. I want to use those wires. <laughs> it's a matter of economics, sir. A circuit like that would need thousands of pounds of copper per mile. To support the added weight, more poles would be needed, or else heavier ones. With a wider spacing, fewer wires could be carried on the cross arms. The investment would be tremendous. So you can imagine what the rate would be. Maybe $100. Would you want to pay that? No, of course not. Still, at times, it might be worth more than $100. Well, there's the fundamental problem. To make wires talk, and to make it worth your while to use them. I see. I see. Well, I guess you fellows know what you're doing. I saw Mr. Bell's invention at the Centennial in 76. You've gone a long way since then. I suppose I should be grateful for what we have. Well, thank you very much. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. I hope you'll recommend the service to your friends. I'm doing that all the while. I suppose someday you'll have a lot of wires to Chicago. In fact, I'm in one of those cables I see around town. <laughs> no cable to Chicago, I'm afraid. You can talk through cables less than 100 miles. Guess we'll stick to these number eights up on poles where we can watch them. Good day, sir. <laughs> Goodbye. No cable to Chicago, thought the engineers of 1892. There was no scientific experience that could foresee it. But there is such a cable 
and in the picture record of its completion is the presence of some of those same engineers watching the ceremony of the final splice. And this cable, as we heard foretold a moment ago, is packed with wire circuits so that the pulsing, interrelated life of great urban communities may be expressed in speech over the miles. In the record, too, is a still more significant reminder of progress, a type of cable with only four conductors providing channels for hundreds of simultaneous conversations. And while glancing at these exhibits of development, let us mark still another achievement. It is the grouping in a single sheathing of 4,242 strands of insulated wire that may be buried so confidently beneath the city's streets as channels for the speech of its citizens. Certainly an exciting transmission problem, that of making cable circuits conform to the needs of changing times. Yet its intriguing history is but one of a thousand chapters in the telephone story, each replete with the thrills of discovery, of technical application, of development and change to match progress in a thousand directions. It is a record that reveals the astonishing ramifications of scientific persistency. There's a half century of history for you installers to read if you would know about the hundred and more types of transmitters and receivers preceding the instruments that today you put to work so skillfully. And you with switching mechanisms in your care, a vast literature awaits you if you would retrace the path leading back to the beginning of intercommunication. You men of the cables and open wires who build the lines and keep them efficient for the flying speech of this modern day. Look in the record if you would know what went before the writing of your present manuals of technique. And you guardians of the amplifiers that help to make a whisper recognizable around the world. There's historic drama for you in the record of engineering and laboratory adventuring that gave you your tools of today. Deduct from the telephone art what a search of this record will disclose and you have left, as you all know, nothing but the first crude instrument. The temptation to explore that record here is strong indeed, but there is time to pause at but a few of the pages that refer to this anniversary story. Our narrative is still in the early 90s. There were 300,000 telephones in the nation. From all important population centers, the lines were spreading to suburban areas. A system of long-distance lines was growing, but its limited range is revealed in a special directory of that day, a book listing all the telephones in America that were connected with this system by all metal circuits. It was called a national directory. Yet, the telephones it listed were in only 14 states and a thousand miles was still the limit for talking. But men were thinking, men were experimenting. And at the beginning of the century, there came to telephone engineers a device that would preserve weakened energy on long circuits. It was the loading coil. To understand the loading principle, we can think of energy being applied at one end of a rope. A wave pattern is created, but it soon disappears because of the rope's resistance. But if the rope is loaded with weights at proper intervals, the initial energy is not so quickly lost. Thus, the wave pattern is maintained for a longer distance. There was another development of the period that bears upon this anniversary resume. This was the possibility of arranging two circuits in such a way that a third circuit for conversation would be created. This third circuit is what you call a phantom circuit. The engineers who plan for these invisible carriers of speech know best the millions of miles of copper wire that the phantom principle has saved. As experience was gained in the scientific loading of circuits, hundreds of miles were added to the range of the spoken word. Historic advertisements told that an unlimited range was the hope, but limits still remained. And from the circuit map came the challenge of the gaps yet to be bridged, not just by wires, but by wires that would talk. Excuse me. The door was open, so I walked in. That's all right. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'm after some information about your service. I'm rather a large user. In fact, my firm uses several of your private wires. You probably should talk with the commercial manager. I'm uh, an engineer. Well, that reminds me, sir. I talked with one of your engineers. 
nearly 20 years ago. He said something about waves. Said you needed something that would make the long distance wires talk farther. He must have meant a repeating device or an amplifier, something of that sort. Oh, that was it. I'm glad you found it. Oh, we've been developing repeaters for several years, but we haven't solved the problem by any means. I thought you had. Why, down at the office, we often talk to St. Louis, Omaha. Service is pretty good, too. And now this statement by your president in the morning paper says we soon have service to the coast. Oh, he doesn't say soon, does he? No. He just believes that universal service is on the way. Well, I, I'm afraid I read it hastily. Oh, what is the difficulty? You say you have those repeater things. Yes, but they've got to be better, much better. We're in a peculiar position. We know definitely what we need, and it doesn't even exist. That puts it right up to us, doesn't it? I just can't grasp the problem. The problem is to get the telephone waves to the distant end with volume enough, without distortion, and without picking up a lot of noise. Now, the lines we're using are loaded with... Loaded? With what? Well, uh, loading in telephony is uh, rather difficult to explain to the layman. But it means that coils of wire, like this, wound on iron cores, are introduced into the line every few miles. They don't add additional energy, but they do conserve what we have. They make the entire length of telephone line more efficient. Well, what are these uh, thingamajigs you call repeaters? They are also devices which are introduced into the line, but much farther apart than loading coils. They actually introduce new energy into the line to restore the electrical current when it becomes weakened. Well, can't you use your coils and your repeaters together? Same one of the most tantalizing problems in our engineering. Here's the most important element in the repeaters we're using today. If we put a repeater employing one of these elements on a loaded circuit, the result is fairly good, up to a certain distance. Well, if one of them helps, why not use a lot of them? It can't be done. If we use more than one on the circuit, there's distortion and other troubles, too. There's no point in transmitting badly distorted speech, is there? Then Denver is the limit from here. It really is a little bit more than the limit. We are very proud of that circuit. It's all very confusing. You've improved your line, still you need a repeater. Use a couple of repeaters, and right away you hurt your line. I never dreamed it was such a, uh, such a scientific matter. Let me put it briefly. There are three considerations to this problem of getting your remarks in New York over a wire to, uh, well, let us say, San Francisco. First, the best possible amplifying devices. Second, the best possible lines made suitable for those devices. Third, the best possible circuit arrangements for combining the two. Now, I suppose that sounds pretty technical. Yes, don't tell me anymore. I'm mixed up enough already. What I mean is, Everything must be engineered to work together. When we get the amplifier we're after, we may have to make adjustments in the loading, or else the amplifier won't operate. The circuit arrangements may have to be changed. We don't know that yet. Every improvement affects everything we've got already. That's telephony. Well, good luck to you. I hope you'll find what you're after. We expect to do it. It's our job to do it. We have a splendid scientific organization. Some brilliant men have been assigned to this particular problem. We're not going to give up. When you hear that we have a line to the coast, a line that talks, you'll know that America has given something mighty important to the world. It certainly will be important. Well, thank you, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Just what was the job they wouldn't give up? It was the same as yours today, to get the message through. But the vital challenge then was to men of science, and the message was to be the first hello across the continent of North America. How that challenge was met, how telephone men from coast to coast teamed up to translate the accomplishment into an agency of service is one of the great chapters of telephone history. The details of the story are legion. They involve the activities of an army, led by foresight and faith, and inspired by a compelling sense of high purpose in an adventure of exciting significance. To the Western Telephone Organizations was to come a pioneering building assignment that demanded the utmost in enthusiasm, 
in skill and devotion. In the record is the name of every man who helped in that construction task. Every surveyor, teamster, cook, lineman, ground man, foreman, superintendent, engineer. And the men of the long lines at headquarters and along their circuits all the way to the Rockies had coordinating responsibilities of the most exacting character that call for equal devotion and skill. It was an army that moved. It was an army that achieved. Of its activities on a wide and changing front, there can be but the merest hint in this anniversary tribute. Build that line to California. We'll make it work. We must develop another type of repeater. New York wants a report on our lines west of Denver. New York's talking about a phantom group clear across the country. This mercury arc repeater still seems too erratic. Let's see what the labs can do with this vacuum tube. We'll meet the Pacific men at the Nevada line. There's got to be a better vacuum. Start out the surveyors. Put transcontinental estimates in the budget. Keep up the mathematical research. We build and repair to Salt Lake, then 130 miles west, all new. Present construction to the Reno area, then 400 miles east, all new. Set up 3,500 miles of artificial line for testing. Sure, divisions one, four, and five are ready. Five hundred men can do it. Let's get organized. We'll use fourteen thousand poles crossing Nevada. This new tube design might work with better lines. Remeasure loading and transposing. New York to Denver. It must be accurate. <laughs> loading every eight miles across the country. Repeaters ready for the first test? All ready. Recurrent.
More than 30,000 of today's telephone forces were in Bell System service on that January day of 1915 when greetings between East and West spanned 3,400 miles in dedication ceremonies. To these thousands, the developments of succeeding years must indeed make a story of vivid reminiscence. On that day, there was a single overland route, a so-called phantom group of three circuits only, a voice highway hailed as a miracle. And now, there are four great modern communication arteries crossing the plains and skating the western mountains, each with a multitude of channels along which may flow the words that bind together all sections of our country. The historic amplifiers of the first transcontinental test are treasured as ancestors of nearly a half million that today give their restoring impulses to the currents coursing through them at a thousand strategic centers. A frequency range of about 900 cycles represented the first speech that united East and West. Today, there is three times that pioneer range to bring about the clarity that distinguishes nationwide transmission. And three times three does not tell the extent to its special circuits. 50,000 miles of them can bring to radio stations the overtones of symphony and song. Storm-proof cables now span distances of unbelievable magnitude to the engineers of that first transcontinental highway. Direct circuits to faraway cities radiate from busy centers that switching may be minimized and the time gap shortened between your call, please, and ready with Atlanta. Antennas dot the coasts to take from the wires the voice of America and herd it to the telephones of six continents and to ships at sea, while others lift their alert and sensitive wires to catch the waves that hold the answering words. Truly today, Earth has no limit to human speech because of science and because of the men and women who guard and guide what science has revealed. Someone will find out how to use it better. Something tells me.